Hi, my name is Nick Davis from Nick Davis Hypnotherapy NLP and Life Coaching, and today I'm joined by Charmaine Johns once again. Hello, Charmaine, how are you? Hi, I'm good, thanks. How are you doing? And Charmaine's recovering from the coronavirus and lives in northern Italy. And to follow on from yesterday's video, we're going to talk about exit strategy. So, what does that mean to you, and what would you like to share about exit strategy with regards to coronavirus? I think that the uh, you know everybody is very being very caught up in quarantines and and obviously the world is is reacting in stages so obviously China has come out the other end now apparently they've got no new cases um, but it's it's a wave that's traveling across uh, the globe and Italy is as you know has been in this situation for quite a long time now and people are fixating on the on what they consider to be the end date and it's, it's an interesting concept because I'm not sure there, there is an end date, but you know, when you're told that quarantine is going to end on the 4th of April, which is currently the date here, um, it then begs the question as, you know, as to what the exit strategy is and, and by an exit strategy, um, you know, how are the countries um, going to come out of quarantine um, and start operating under usual circumstances when potentially there are other countries surrounding them. So the UK is, is obviously unique in that it's an island. So it's, mm. you know, it's, it's, it doesn't have international borders in, in that respect, the same way that Europe does. But, you know, in Italy, as you know now, you know, Spain is, has, has overtaken today. The news was saying that Spain has now got, oh, sorry, the US has got more cases than Spain. Um, but Spain is, you know, is really, really suffering. Um, it's, it's got a very high uh, mortality rate at the moment. Um, and, you know, Italy has got a number of borders with countries that are struggling. So the question is, you know, how, if, if, if we manage to, you know, flatten the curve, which I think is the, is yeah. the, the kind of the buzz sentence, then what happens? You know, if well, Italy manages to get it under control, sorry. So, so you've been given an end date in Italy of, of, of roughly a week, is that right? Well, it's not necessarily an end date. It was the date that the government uh, gave uh, citizens to say, yeah. you know, this is the date, you know, by the 4th of April, everything is locked down. Because obviously you can't lock a country down and just say it's locked down and, yeah, you know, we'll get back to you. Yeah. yeah. So they've kind of given people a date, but, you know, the numbers aren't necessarily changing. People are still getting ill. Um, you know, the, the numbers are thousands um, and Spain is struggling. So, you know, if everyone then decides on the 4th of April, great, okay, it's over, we're out, we're outside, mm. we're back at the shops, we're socializing, um, what happens? You know, how do they open the borders? How do they, how do they know that it's going to be safe? And I, I think everyone's very worried mm. about this because people want to get back to their lives. Um, it would be great for me to be able to go back to the UK at some point. Um, but that's quite a scary concept because, um, gosh, I, you know, I don't, I, I don't know how I would get across Europe. I drove here, so I'd have to drive across, you mm. know, France and France is locked down, um, Belgium, uh, and then go back into the UK and, you know, where, where are they on the timeline? Mm. Um, you know, are they going to be next week where Italy was three weeks ago? So um, it's, yeah. it, it, with regards to Italy, do you think that's a realistic date they've been given or do you think that's going to be extended? And how are you over the, uh, are you flattening the curve in Italy yet? Or? I, I, I mean, I, you know, I don't, I don't, obviously I'm not a scientist and I don't work, in, I'm not in the medical profession. Um, we have to rely on the news. We have to rely on, on what people tell us, uh, what people report. Um, I, you know, I think <clears throat> in terms of, um, the way that illnesses are, you know, tracked. I think people have put into traditionally put into, into typically put into three groups. You have the susceptible, you have the uh, infected, and you have the recovered. Um, but in this scenario, we have the unrecorded as well. And when mm -hmm. a country doesn't undertake testing, um, you know, widespread testing, yeah. you've got this vast number that you have absolutely no idea: are they infected? You know, are they immune? Mm. Have they recovered? You just don't know. Yeah. So you know, I don't. I don't know how long this is going to go on. Um, certainly, I think that the, the death rate in in Italy is going to have to, you know, 
drop considerably to well it's going to have to be zero i, I think they're going to mm -hmm. they're going to have to do something about that but i think it comes back to um you know we were talking about this earlier and and you know there are quite a few people who've commented to me that they believe they they had this illness you know yeah. maybe earlier in the year they might have had it last year all the symptoms sound mm -hmm. or feel you know very familiar so you know how do we know when it's under control we know that people mm -hmm. are hugely um uh contagious when you know when they don't necessarily realize it and i think now more and more cases are coming out of people who are younger not ill no pre-existing -pre conditions mm -hmm. so there i think there's still far too many questions um than there are answers and i, I Personally, I, I think the, the time that things will start turning a corner will be when the numbers potentially s sort of start dropping. Mm. Uh, when this has kind of traveled all the way around the world, you know, at the moment, New York is, it has, is taking a massive hit. Um, but that's just the start, I think. You know, this thing seems to be moving from, from right to left, mm. you know, if, as we look at the world. But, you know, I don't know how true that is. Um, and also we've... We, you know, we're desperately waiting for some kind of light at the end of the tunnel in terms of um, some treatments, whether it's treating people who are already infected or vaccinating them against potentially being um, being infected. So, you know, I, all I, you know, the only way I've managed to, you know, manage myself and my own stress levels because it's very easy to get caught up in in, in mm -hmm. you know all these videos going around in emergency wards and it's yeah. you know people going in for emergency treatment and then ending up in, in critical care, you know, it's heartbreaking to watch. Mm. Um, the trauma that people must be experiencing, especially in a country like Italy and countries like Spain, where there's such a, a close knit familial um, yeah. setup, you know, people, three generations live in one house, you know, it's, it's very, very close. And yeah. for those people not to be able to see their relatives in hospital, see them ill, not be with them when they pass away, not be at the funeral, yeah, I can't. I can only imagine how the, the knock on knock on effect is huge, isn't it? Oh, I, you know, the, and this is people. This is you know, this is like a war. You know, you have to live with that pain, and you you yeah. you've had no resolution. There's no closure. There's no, mm. you know, there's nothing. So I, you know, I think we the, the the thing I've managed to do that I've that seems to have worked, calming my anxiety. Um, you know, when you're isolated and sort of sensory deprived from you know anything outside, um. Is, is just trying to focus on the experts yeah. um, you know, listen to you know the people who really are in the know and um, you know despite some of the the news and information that's coming out of the US for example um, they do have some some excellent medical professionals who know what they're talking about and that, um, I think I think that's one important um, point to make that I tell people as well is that as things change information changes so it's important to stay with the legitimate scientific channels the world health organization the governments and things like that but but also recognize that that information is going to change as we as, as things change and that's why it's, it's great to talk to you in italy because you're quite a few weeks ahead of where we are i think um mm, yes i you know obviously i'm like i said i'm not in a i'm not in a city um yeah. you know we, we see a lot of that on the news but i think you know the flip side of that is is that you know, it's it's uh, the focus is on the bigger is they're on the the, the densely populated areas. Yeah. Uh, you know, what about the small towns? What about the the environments where where people? You know, you've got working class people who work very hard all winter. They rely on winter for you know their income. Um, yeah. It's seasonal. Uh, you know, they don't. You, you know, you don't see all of that information in the press um, as much, and it's it's highly it's very delicate because there's a reputational aspect to this. You know, I've read in the papers and, and some of the news bulletins about countries that have, you know, towns that have been, you know, almost vilified because they've been, the, you know, the cause of the outbreak or the start of the outbreak or, you know, how yeah. you want to phrase it. And, you know, that the, there are people living in these towns who are passionate about where they live, their mm -hmm. culture, the work they do. And yeah. this is deeply personal. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, there's more to this than, you know there is that reputational damage and uh, and it's it's heartbreaking it really is uh, especially in a a country that is you know struggles at the best of times you know italy's not the the strongest economic 
country, you know, in the world um, or in Europe. Uh, and, you know, things like this, you know, will really hit it hard. And, and that, that, I find that upsetting. The other thing we mentioned about nature is a lot of people saying, you know, has nature stepped in to give us this virus because we were, I don't know, mistreating the planet? Yes, I think, uh, you know, I, I do try, there are positives in everything. You know, I'm not saying that, 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 you know, every cloud, you know, this is a very, very dark cloud and there may well be a silver lining in there somewhere, but, but not for everybody. Mm. Um, but I have been, um, I've been very touched when I've looked at, uh, you know, you see the photographs of Venice where mm. the canals are clear. There's no, you know, they haven't used, there's no motorboats going. So the, the silt has all dropped to the bottom. They're fish. It's mm. these beautiful translucent blue um, canals that nobody's seen for, gosh, you know. Yeah, I've, I've noticed how long. A long, long time, yeah. you know, maybe even 100 years. Uh, you've got harbours where um, you've got dolphins uh, coming in. Um, you know, the satellite photographs over China and, and Italy and Europe with smog mm -hmm. and, you know, all those, those sorts of things. So um, a number of years ago when foot and mouth hit the UK, uh, I was fortunately, unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, um, I was actually living in the Yorkshire Dales at the time, and I was in an area that was um, that literally my house was on the boundary of a of an area that was um, quarantined for foot and mouth, and it really again, I mean, it was it wasn't as obviously as widespread. It, it was relatively restricted to the UK, parts of Ireland, um, you know, the countryside, so it didn't. It, 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 it affected the food chain to a degree because obviously there was a lot of culling going on of, of, of uh, livestock um, and it had a devastating effect on not only the mental health of mm. the people having to literally eradicate their entire livelihood yeah. um, but on communities and um, you know there were some desperate stories uh, you know the suicide rate was high uh, you'd have this you know this very the sort of dichotomy of some people who got compensation from the government and could buy you know brand new tractors and brand new this and the other and then you've got people who just lost lost their flocks lost their herds and mm -hmm. you know that that was the end of it um but one of the things that i remember um obviously the countryside you had to um you weren't allowed to drive they they, they st a lot of the areas they they've um restricted cars um, and at night we would have all these massive vehicles coming in to collect all of the, the carcasses of the, of the animals. Um, but the public were not allowed in. You weren't allowed to walk across the fields and you had these uh, sort of bays sort of dug into the ground of citric acid that your cars and your feet, you'd have to wash your feet off and, and your tires would have to go through this. And I remember speaking to um, uh, an, an, an elderly neighbor, someone who lived in the area and they commented that in a very short space of time, they started seeing live wildlife that they hadn't seen mm. for decades. So what in particular, the curlew. Yeah. And it, it just never ceases to amaze me how um, quickly nature mm. will, will see an opportunity and just flourish. It'll just go, oh, wow, there's a gap, you know, and, and just yeah. step in there and, and start to change. And I think that's one of the positives on this. And, you know, you mentioned, have we brought this on ourselves? And I was reading a, a very interesting article in the Times um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and there was reference to, um, for example, Ebola. Now, Ebola yeah. lives in bats per perfectly happily. But when you deforest an area, uh, that where gorillas live, you know, obviously lots of species end up getting close to each other that they wouldn't normally do because they're searching for food. So mm. the gorillas pick up the Ebola. It's then transmittable from from um, from gorillas to humans. And obviously the Ebola crisis in Central Africa, and you know, we remember that story in the news. But mm. it happened over there. You know, it was it was Médecins Sans Frontières, and it was all these aid you know, agencies and, and medical um, charities and everybody was just trying to, to try and get this thing under control because it was a ghastly disease. Um, and the same thing, you know, people are, are drawing similar parallels now with, with coronavirus because in areas of, in, in the Far East, for example, they are destroying the habitat. Um, who knows what the fire in the Amazon last year did mm. uh, in terms of making species having to travel further to look for food. And 
you know, the, the, when you have markets, um, live animal markets like they do in China and they do in some of the Far East countries or the Asian countries, um, you, all you need, all a virus needs is a host. Yeah. And once it's found a host, um, you know, it, it can jump to humans quite quickly. And I think that's the terrifying thing is that we are almost bringing this on ourselves because we, you know, we deforest for palm oil. We, you know, that the world is, is, is just going yeah. mad. And it does strike me that this may well be an opportunity for, uh, I remember, I thought this a few weeks ago myself, but I remember reading, you know, I've seen a few people comment on this on social media and it's like mother nature's almost saying, you know, go to your room and think about what you've done. You yeah. know, don't come out <laughs> because, you know, yeah. and I think that's a really good way of putting it because how else will you stop the world? How else can you control or delete or, you know, restart everything without everybody, everybody having well, to there, participate? There was an interesting study a long time ago where um, they, they studied fruit flies and they said whenever fruit flies became overpopulated, they'd keep them in jars. Um, and whenever they became overpopulated for the particular jar, they said three things would happen, either war, famine or disease. And that would call the population until they got back to however many would live there. So, you know, um, not only are we deforesting and getting and really it's greed, really, that we're, we're doing things and creating things and harvesting things that we don't need for greed. And are we overpopulated now? You know, is that what nature's doing? There are, I agree, you know, and, and we have a very different, you know, take on life, you know, it's, it, you know, we preserve life at all costs. Mm. And yet I can't help feeling, you know, I can't help feeling a huge amount of empathy for people in war zones. You know, there are, there are actual mm. war zones as, you know, as we speak, there, there are places that are, you know, Syria, yeah. you know, that have been at war for so long and, you know you you can't help but think to yourself okay so this is what it's like you know obviously we don't have the bombs and we don't have that that level of widespread violence mm. um but it's it's you know it's a very similar kind of uh kind of thing where we really are being you know sort of yanked mm. by the earlobe and told to just you know look at what's going on around us and I, I, you know, I, we, we have to focus where we can on the positive. And I'm not saying that this is a positive experience for everybody. You know, there's mm. going to be a lot of people who are distressed and traumatized and have no way of making sense of, of all of the stuff that's, you know, that, that's coming on or coming out. Um, but I think when we are able to, we need to yeah. put part of our day aside to just go, okay, right. I know that the world is going crazy mm -hmm. and it's awful, but what are we grateful for? You know, what can we focus on? And I, and I think that's a great thing, you know, focusing on the great things like our, you know, our national health services, you know, our logistics, the infrastructure, the way that we're still putting food on the shelves and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and life is, you know, although we're on lockdown, life is, reasonably normal you know we do have access to fresh running, running water the internet telephones mm -hmm. you know it's, it, it's nothing like the second world war where people didn't have access to those forms of communication um, precisely you know think about the spanish flu you know the spanish flu infected half a billion people it killed in excess of 55 million people you know this is nowhere near that but mm. you know we we have so much more at our disposal we have you know we haven't been rationed which is yeah. what everybody went through during the war you know that's i know that i know there's always been an argument that people said uh, that you know a lot of people came out healthier after the war because all of you know they they'd been rationed and they were eating sensible you know eating sensibly there was no meat and butter and you know it was all rationed um but yeah, you're right. You know, I think that there's a there's definitely an opportunity for us to um, be grateful for the fact that we have technology. You know, yeah. what what better time for us to change our relationship with technology so yeah. that instead of it being something that interferes with how we interact with people, you know, sitting at a meal, sitting at a table, um, you know, having a meal on your phone, you know, which is yeah. just ridiculous, uh, to um, 
and by the way, I get told off, you know, if I'm, if I go and eat somewhere here locally, I've, I've been told off for looking at my phone while I've been eating my meal, you know, so there are countries that still frown upon that, uh, you know, sort of frown on that kind of behavior, but what a better, what, you know, what, what better opportunity to change our relationship with technology. And yeah. instead of it being something that disconnects us, which yeah. it has been, it's mm -hmm. now turned on its head and it's connecting us in a way that nobody ever would have thought possible. And I think that's an amazing, uh, you know, that's an amazing positive yeah. and it's giving people real perspective. Um, and I hope that for the generation who don't remember how to use a rotary phone and, you know, don't quite, you know, just, yeah. it just is alien to them. I really hope that they come out of this going, do you know, I've learned my, I've done my schoolwork. I've done exercises. I've connected with my friends. It's been a positive experience. So I think yeah. we have to, you know, we really have a duty to ourselves yeah. uh, to raise our own level of, optimism and hope and positivity by just you know I, I try and make a window every day to just mm -hmm. think of the things that you know yeah everything's pants at the moment but let me just look at the stuff that is good yeah um and it you know it just it it, it gives you a little kind of hug yeah yes thank you for that Charmaine and, and you know just to put things into perspective I'm sure we were moaning about Brexit a few, well, for the last three years or so, and that, that was the thing hanging around our heads. And I'm sure people would swap places with that time, you know, like that now. Um, mm. And that is, that, you know, that's it. It's about well, putting things into perspective. Perspective, yeah, totally. Absolutely, and I agree. I agree with you. Brilliant. Thanks for your time, Charmaine, as usual. And I will speak to you again soon. So you take good care. Great. You too. Thanks a lot. Thank you.